Hello and welcome to Touching the Sunrise podcast. I am Sister Catherine Herms, author of Surviving Depression, A Catholic Approach, and Reclaim Regret, How God Heals Life's Disappointments, and Spiritual Guide in the Heartwork Program, which specializes in helping people walk the road of spiritual growth and inner healing. For the past 10 years, I have been walking alongside wonderful women and men who want a more heart-centered and spiritual life, but would like support along the way. Through online programs, a Facebook group, a heartwork community, and one-on-one spiritual guidance, I walk with people on a contemplative and healing path, one that has been trodden for thousands of years. Basically, I'm here to help you surrender to the power of the Holy Spirit, who has come to make your being the throne of the Holy Trinity, so that your life, your prayer, your relationships, your dreams and goals and desires will most deeply satisfy the longings of your heart. You can find out more about me and what God has led me to do in the world by visiting my website, touchingthesunrise.com. So let's start as we always do, gathering ourselves together, allowing our mind to sink deeply into the depths of our heart, of our soul, finding that inner space, that inner eye that can see God, that can see the light with which he is present within our souls. That part of us that can sense that there is more than us. There's more than what we can see. That can touch the deeper part of reality. That is God's presence in everything, everywhere. Take a deep breath directly into your heart even deeper than into your heart, into that organ that divine grace transforms with the presence, the light, and the life of the divine trinity. With Teresa of Avila, we enter into our inner world as if we are entering a mansion or a castle. In the centermost room of the castle is silence, a pulsing, dynamic call of love that can only come from the one who is love himself. We enter the castle through the doors from the outside and make our way gradually toward that inner sanctuary where God abides. That place from where he is filling our entire being with his light. On the journey through the rooms as we approach the center, we need to face our resistances, our weakness, our desires, our sin our passions, our bentness. Every time we see new things about our humanness, we become more open, more malleable, more godlike. So let your heart call out to your God. Let your thoughts melt and surrender to the work of the Spirit. So what a journey these past three weeks have been. During them, you have absorbed a great secret of the spiritual life. Can you guess what it is? It is this, the spiritual life, prayer, spiritual development, the journey to holiness, whatever terms you use to identify your journey in Christ to the Father, it begins not with a method or a practice or a prayer. It begins with a face. That journey begins with a voice that at a certain moment relates to you with stronger, more urgent, more insistent tones. Many years ago, I would resolve that I needed to pray extra or adopt a certain practice or do special things in order to grow in holiness. What I really needed to do and eventually learned is that it's the voice of the Lord that initiates any movement along the way. Many times that movement is mysterious. 
Sometimes it feels like we aren't moving at all or that we're moving backwards. As long as we, like Gabriel Bosis, keep speaking to Jesus about what is in our heart, the questions we have, the fears, the struggles to be or do what we think that the Lord wants of us, we will begin to hear the voice within us, assuring us that He is leading the way. We simply need to respond. So, just as on the road to Damascus when Jesus met Paul, and he began a very profound transformation that reached into the very essence of who he knew himself to be, the saints also have had moments when they heard the voice of God or experienced a dynamic movement of the Spirit within. One day at Holy Communion, Mother Teresa of Calcutta heard Jesus say, Quote, I want Indian nuns who would be Mary and Martha, who would be so united to me as to radiate my love on souls. It was through these communications of the Eucharistic Jesus that Mother Teresa received her directions for forming her congregation of the Missionaries of Charity. For Gabriel Bosis, it happened of all places on a cruise ship that was crossing the Atlantic from France to Canada when she was 62 years old. She was going to Canada to organize a theater tour and she had a notebook with her which she planned to use professionally when instead Jesus spoke to her in her heart and she ended up using that notebook and many, many others to share his words with the world. For you, can you trace your story? Can you identify the point, or most likely points, at which the Lord has broken into your life? Those times when the Lord arrested your attention, or perhaps he knocked you over the head, or, or assured you of his love. These tell your story of love, your love story with the Lord. They are each points along a very beautiful path, as beautiful as that recounted in He and I and Jesus speaking. As you plot your points of more intense relationship with the Lord, you might also notice that you didn't make a beeline for perfection. You and I sometimes get distracted by the things we have or things we want. At other times, discouragement and disillusionment weigh us down. Fatigue takes its toll on our attention. Illness might break up the communication between us and the Lord for a time. Frustration at discovering that we are not who we thought we were, and sorrow fills us at sins or bad habits we can't shake. We find it hard to believe, to really believe, that we are absolutely and irrevocably loved by this tender lover. As we assess where we are, another existential reality looms larger and larger on the horizon. That reality is death, and eternity. I've heard these words often. I hope God is taking notice of what I'm doing and counts it to my credit and doesn't notice the earlier years of my life. As we approach our midlife years and beyond, an inner nervousness may make itself felt. Have I been holy enough? Look at the mistakes, the sins, the falls. The wasted time. To this, I share these words of Jesus to Gabriel Bosis. She asked Jesus on January 16, 1947, I was thinking of the 5% discounts and I said to myself, will we ever be able to get holiness to more easily? Listen to his response said directly to your own heart. Quote, 
You can't compute holiness like a column of figures. A single act of love with absolute abandonment and trust can make a saint even at the moment of death. And how this honors me. I am like Samson. I lose my power as judge when someone tells me of his faithful love. Not because the love is so great either, but because it is the greatest he has to offer me. It touches me to the quick, and I am ready to bend to his will and make it my own. Jesus teaches her what to do when she is overwhelmed by her incapability in loving him and doing his will. He says, Why are you astonished, my child? Hasn't your life always been one continual beginning again? I love you this way, humbled, but ready to do better for love of me. It's then that I come to your help, and the Spirit fills you because your eyes are open to your own worthlessness, and empty of self, you are ready at last to let him take complete possession of you. Take a look at your usual incapability. Acknowledge your poor judgment. See how little you are inclined to make any effort, as though you lost interest in my glory. Show me your inadequacies, especially the most discouraging ones, such as your lack of perseverance in keeping watch on your bad habit. Tell me how it distresses you, but be sure that this distress is because of my distress. Then try to make amends with words of love, silences, upsoarings of your heart, repentance in your simple, sincere way. With new resolutions, take my mother into your confidence. She'll help you keep watch. It will be easier with both of you, won't it? And then he encourages her, take a long look at me. Doesn't one love to gaze at the face of a matchless friend? Isn't there power in a look at him? And if this friend is your ideal in every kind of virtue, if he is the resplendence of every perfection, each time you look, won't you find strength to imitate him? Jesus is speaking to us in these words. These words from the book that he and I just draw me in trust when I look back at my life, at my day, at the last hour. When I have forgotten him, where I fell into a bad habit, and he's continually saying one thing, look at me. I am your friend, and I will help you. Jesus urges Gabriel, and through her, no, directly he insists on this with us, because his love for you and me is so overwhelming in his heart, he says, on March 1st, 1939, it's not enough to know about this love. Above all, you must have faith in it. How much comfort people would find and what happiness, even in the midst of trials, if they only believed that everything that happens to them comes from my desire to do them good and that all is fitted to the measure of each one. This tender insistence that we believe in his love is not easy. I don't find it easy. Do you? We still fear. We, we want to take things into our own hands, even as our control slips through our fingers as the years pass by. And so I want to share with you the last three entries of He and I. Gabrielle Bosis herself struggled with this, even after years of Jesus assuring her of his love. She writes shortly before her death on May 23, 1950, Communion of the Sick. Jesus says, Poor little soul, 
You've waited to the very last minute of your life to believe in my boundless compassion, in the final forgiveness. Have no more fear of anything. It would wound me if you were afraid. Surrender your whole being to love, my beloved. And she writes on the next day, no more strength, I can scarcely see. I'm scarcely able to love you. And he responds, take my eyes, take my voice, take my love. On May 25th, have I come to the end of my life? Is this the moment when I celebrate my first and last mass? Where are you, loving presence? And afterward, what will it be? And Jesus responds, It will be I. It will be I forevermore. The meditation in Jesus speaking for December 9th that lovely devotional that's made out of these mysterious, comforting, and so enlightening words of Jesus, that conversation between Jesus and Gabriel that's recorded in the book, He and I. I want to leave you with these words that you can find on December 9th. Jesus says, I don't want people to be afraid of me anymore but to see my heart full of love and to speak with me as they would with a dearly beloved brother. For some I am unknown, for others a stranger, a severe master, or an accuser. Few people come to me as to one of a loved family, and yet my love is there, waiting for them. So when you consider these words, What stirs in your heart? God has amazing ways of knocking on people's hearts, awakening desires, arousing questions, provoking an unexpected spiritual fire. Remember, if you'd like some extra support and are ready to embark on a sustained spiritual journey, you can connect with me in a number of ways by going to my website, touchingthesunrise.com. Until the next time, take care of yourself and remember that you are not alone. You are loved no matter what. And when you search within yourself, you will find not only you, but you will find God. You will find Jesus reaching his hand out to you. You have a calling from God, a mission from God, And every gift, every grace, every moment, even every fall, mistake, and sin is a step toward your completely and wholly being taken up into the mystery of God's love for you and for all creation. Remember always that you have a treasure of inexpressible joy hidden in an earthen vessel, small and fragile. May this overflowing joy fill you with its fragrance. God be with you.